Yeah, welcome to another session of the grammatical theory lecture. Um, today we will cover generalized phrase structure grammar. Um, this is an outline of the complete course. So we already had a, a part on um, basic terms, some introductory remarks, um, part about phrase structure grammar and expa theory. And we introduced government and binding theory. And today we will deal with generalized phrase structure grammar, which is the first uh, alternative to transformational theories, um, which was, so, so to say, uh, mainstream generative grammar. And the other um, theories we will deal with are alternatives to, these, uh, to this type of theory. The reading material uh, is again the grammatical theory textbook, um, chapter five, and um, the, the slides do not discuss semantic issues. So you may skip the, uh, the section about semantics, although it's interesting to, to read it. Uh, all the theories uh, are paired with uh, semantics and um, that's part of the the introduction of this series, but we don't deal with it uh, in this um, in this lecture uh, in the slide presentation. Okay, so uh, GPSG was developed as an answer to transformational grammar at the end of the seventies. Um, uh, the main publication is Gusta Klein Polem and Sack. That's a, a book about uh, GPSG grammar for English. And um, it, it appeared in 85 uh, where the, the time where um, GPSG was over uh, mainly um, because of some, some formal uh, properties of languages. So I will uh, tell you about that at the end of uh, this session. Um, so the main publication is also the final publication basically or almost the final and um, but but the main innovations of this framework uh, survived that were transferred into uh, other uh, frameworks were taken over by other frameworks. Um, the basis for this session is a, a book by Hans Oskoreit, published in 87. That was uh, his uh, dissertation, grew out of his dissertation in 85. Um, and he developed a larger uh, fragment of German in the framework of GPSG. And we will just discuss this, uh, his suggestions um, and what follows. So the starting point of transformational grammar was that Chomsky showed that phrase structure grammars are not adequate. So you cannot capture certain generalizations, connection between active and passive and so on. And um, GPSG showed that if you have, or if you assume certain extensions to phrase structure grammars, um, that you can address the, um, the, the points that Chomsky, Chomsky made. So for instance, um, categories of node labels in, in trees may be complex rather than atomic. That's something we already had in the introduction to phrase structure grammar, where we had features, right, remember? So we had a, a case feature and so on. That was um, something that Harman suggested in 63 already. Um, then they suggested uh, a different treatment of local reordering. So remember we had uh, in NGB, we had some movement, so some, some base order, and then uh, items were moved to other positions in, in the tree. Um, that is done differently in GPSG. And um, then they had an interesting uh, new tool um, that is called meta rules that maps uh, a certain set of rules uh, onto other uh, rules. And um, there was an interesting 
treatment of non-local dependencies as a series of local dependencies. Um, we will have a look at all of these innovation in what follows. But it, you, you can see from the fact that it took, tw uh, took 20 years uh, to derive at uh, or arrive at um, GPSG that that was not simple and not obvious. So uh, people did transformational grammar in various ways for, for a long, long time. Okay, so let's start with some general remarks on the representational format. Um, as I already said, categories are set of feature value pairs. So it's not atomic categories uh, as in phrase structure grammar, but more complex um, categories. And um, one of these uh, features that are associated with uh, lexical items or categories in general is um, the feature subcat. And um, that is, the value is just a number. And the number says uh, something about the grammatical rules in which a word can be used. So let's have a look. So th these are examples uh, from Hans Oskarheit's work on German. He assumes um, these grammar rules. So the, the number here is basically the bar level, V2, uh, N2, V3, and um, H stands for head. And these rules are for various types of verbs. So the, and some examples are given here in, in brackets. So this, this is not part of the rule. It's just uh, a comment saying uh, which verbs can be used with the rule. So that is, V2 is basically a, a verb phrase uh, without a subject and it says, okay, um, heads of, uh, that have a subcut value of five can be used with this rule. So that's intransitive verbs that don't take any other argument. Then uh, heads with a, a subcut value six can be used with an accusative object to form a VP. The, the ones with the number seven um, is, can go together with a dative, eight is dative and accusative, and noun is, uh, uh, nine is something that takes a that clause, does clause. So um, you may wonder whether that is important, so which number it is, it's not. You don't have to learn that by heart, so I will never, um, ask you for specific numbers for, for rules. The only thing you have to know is that there are numbers and that you have to, when you write grammars, that you have to invent one number that is unique for a certain set of rules that can be used with a certain class of lexical items. So you could also name these uh, Klaus or something or, or no or something, right? So give it the name that corresponds to a verb. Um, okay, um, this is stuff I already told you. Um, yeah, so the H uh, stands for head, and that means that certain features between the element, certain features are shared between the element that is marked as a head and the left-hand side of the rule. So that's a verbal projection here. So some verb phrase and that means that the head must be a verb as well and if it's finite then the VP is finite and so on. This is a principle. So principles are also parts of uh, the theory of uh, GPSG. Um, the, um, this is a so-called head feature convention the mother node and the head daughter must be the same head features unless indicated otherwise. So that says um, whatever is relevant uh, in terms of features is taken over from the right to the left, but you can state uh, at the left-hand side that there is something different, right? Um, so you can, so to say, overwrite the head features. Then there are uh, 
meta rules and the IDLP format. So that's two, two of the uh, inno innovations in GPSG. Meta rules I already mentioned. That's uh, these are um, rules that map certain rules that the grammar writer writes down onto other rules. So they are productively created uh, new rules uh, by applying meta rules. And the other thing is uh, EDL, the EDLP format, um, where you separate uh, linearization constraints from immediate dominance constraints. And um, we will talk about these two innovations, these two tools uh, in what follows. So in, in connection to the phenomena we want to address. So the first thing that we uh, always talk about when uh, talking about theories uh, is uh, local reordering. Um, we already discussed this in the GB lectures. Um, weil der Mann dem Kind das Buch gibt, that's the um, standard example we will be dealing with, uh, where we have a nominative, a dative and an accusative. They are color coded, so to make that more readable for, for non-Germans, non-German speaking uh, listeners. Um, the, the first example is a so-called uh, normal on, or unmarked order, but we can have uh, all six permutations. So A, B, C, D, E, and F are possible in principle. Um, for some, you need special context. For some, it's better if, uh, if you have pronouns uh, in the initial NP, but in principle, all uh, six permutations of these elements are possible. Um, okay, so if, if you do that with phrase structure rules, um, it's sort of nasty because you need uh, six rules, basically saying, nominative, uh, accusative, dative, nominative, dative, accusative, and so on. So you have to uh, enumerate all these um, possible orders. And that's not all because, um, well, what, what you just saw were the verb final versions, but uh, of course we have the verb initial cases as well, right? So, gibt uh, der Mann der Frau das Buch, um, where, where the order is uh, exactly, well, it, it's the same orders, but the verb is at the initial position. So um, that, that's not great to have uh, 12 phrase structure rules. Um, and that's not all because we have to uh, have the same uh, number of rules for transitive verbs, strictly transitive verbs or verbs with NP and PP and so on. So that's not nice. What uh, the suggestion of uh, GPSG is that one abstracts from linear order. So, and just talks about dominance um, in, in the rules uh, and has uh, immediate dominance schemata and then uh, separately uh, linear precedence rules that restrict the, the order of elements again. So uh, we, we would have a rule like the one in 126 that doesn't say anything about the order of the elements on the right hand side. And um, the only thing it says is that the S node dominates verb NP nominative, NP accusative, and NP dative, and that's it. Um, so principle, it, it's like a like a mobile where you have a top node and then stuff hanging below it, and it can flow around freely. Um, okay, yeah, because there are no constraints, uh, we have just one rule, and uh, we don't need twelve rules uh, instead. Okay. Um, these, these, the, the, the linearization rules that we need um, hold for local trees. So trees of depth one. So it's just 
this, uh, these things that are ordered and uh, with respect to each other, it's not stuff that is inside there. So uh, we don't look deeper than that. It's just these things. And since they are in the same local environment, we can uh, apply linearization rules to them and order things. Um, the interesting thing is that the linearization constraints hold for the whole grammar. So if we have, let's say we have a, a, a rule for transitive verbs, so without the dative here, then uh, we could say, okay, nominative is always preceding accusative. Let's assume we want to do that. And then that rule would apply to this linearization rule would apply to these configurations with nominative and accusative and also to uh, configurations without a dative. So we have to state that linearization rule just once and it applies for, to all the um, dominance configurations that are licensed by the grammar. Now, um, if, if we don't have any restrictions for, for the dominant schema that we suggested so far, uh, it would also admit uh, the, the following order, um, the one in 127, uh, dem Kind der Mann gibt ein Buch. So, the, but that's not German, right? So German is a verb second language um, and, and uh, structures or sequences where we have a dative followed by a nominative are ungrammatical. There are some uh, situations where you have more than one constituent fronted, but they are special. So if you're interested in this, you can have a look at my book about the German clause structure. It's, it's not published yet, but it's, uh, there's a draft on my web page where I explain how these are analyzed. But this really doesn't never occur, right? So there are things where uh, there are multiple frontings containing a subject, but not, uh, I never saw something like uh, dative plus nominative. So we have to have restrictions to rule that out. And um, one restriction, uh, or actually two, in, uh, is the, the ones in 128. Um, the first is saying that uh, a verb in the main clause precedes all other constituents. And the second is uh, the verb in the, uh, not in the main clause, in a, a, a dependent clause is uh, following all other constituents. So now you may say, well, but German is verb second, isn't it? So there should be at least one thing to the left of the verb. But uh, as you will uh, see at the end of the lecture, um, we, that's done differently, right? So that's a non-local dependency. So we need some machinery to take care of that. Uh, what we do with these uh, linearization rules is that we linearize, linearize the verb initially or finally. So nothing else. Okay. Now, do you see we are almost done with GPSG? So it was a lot of, we needed a lot of time for, uh, for GB because we had to introduce the uh, terminology and basic ideas, but now it's, uh, we make progress really quickly. Okay, so uh, the, the next topic is passive. Um, the question is, what do we want? So what, what, what is the really insightful uh, analysis of passive? So what are the properties uh, uh, in, in passive, active passive alternations that we really want to cover? Is it something about movement? No, I argued against that already. Um, so, so in a sort of pre-theoretical, uh, way, what we want to say is that the subject is suppressed and if there is an accusative object, then it is promoted to subject. So that is something that works for German, that works for English and a lot of other languages. And it doesn't have anything to do um, with, with movement. So you, if you don't like subject, uh, you can insert nominative there, right? Okay. Um, the, if, if you, 
look at this description and look at some examples uh, from German, you see that it works. Um, and it's independent of whether you have a intransitive, a transitive or ditransitive verb, right? So here um, we have some examples. The first example is an intransitive verb, weil er noch gearbeitet hat. So that's just the nominative and then the um, gearbeitet. I, I use the participle so that it's a min, uh, minimal pair, uh, weil noch gearbeitet wurde. Right, so here there is no subject, subject is suppressed, and there is no other argument, so there cannot be an object promoted to subject or something like that. It's just um, subject suppressed. And um, if you, the, the second example is uh, a verb with subject and a prepositional object, and weil er an Maria gedacht hat, uh, passive, weil an Maria gedacht wurde. Again, this is a prepositional object. Uh, it doesn't change in passive. The subject is suppressed, fine. Um, the, the same works for, um, uh, for the, the, uh, the case with transitive verbs, weil sie ihn geschlagen hat, um, the, uh, the world champion in chess. Uh, weil er geschlagen wurde. Um, here the, the subject is suppressed, the object is promoted to subject, so uh, instead of accusative it gets nominative, and um, that's what we see in, uh, in, in uh, passive. So the, the first things we saw on the previous slide are also called the impersonal passive and what you see here is a so-called personal passive. It's um, a misnomer, it's, it's a traditional term, so we keep it. Um, I mean, you can have, weil der Schrank geöffnet wurde, um, there is nothing personal uh, about it. It's just an accusative object and it's inanimate. So it's a misnomer, but the, the um, Institut für Deutsche Sprache tried to introduce a one one phase passive and two phase passive as a uh, terminology, but that didn't catch on. So people don't use it. Uh, they keep uh, talking about personal and impersonal passives. Um, yeah, and this is finally an example with a uh, ditransitive verb, uh, weil er ihm den Aufsatz gegeben hat weil ihm der Aufsatz gegeben wurde. Um, uh, again, here is a nominative and an accusative. Nominative is suppressed. Uh, the accusative gets nominative. Fine. Okay, so that, that's sort of what we want to capture. Um, how was it done in GPSG? If we look at phrase structure grammar, we, we are in a situation that Chomsky rightly criticized that um, we would have to write down various uh, rules for the active and the passive cases. That's not nice and we don't capture what is going on in passive, right? Now, GPSG is a non-transformational theory. Um, without transformations, they have to invent another tool to capture the generalization. And uh, what they did is that they invented meta rules that uh, there are certain special rules that derive passive rules from active rules. I will explain the meta rules now um, with respect to, to subject introduction, but then we return to, uh, to the passive afterwards. So, up until now, our rules look like this, right? So we have, for example, so we had some more, but this are, and these are some examples. So we have something with uh, the number seven, uh, taking a dative object and licensing uh, a VP. There is no mention of a subject. So how do we analyze uh, sentences with a subject? So that's like for infinitival verb phrases and so on. But how do we do, uh, how do we deal with sentences with a subject? Um, well, in, in 
phrase in our phrase structure grammar world, we would have to write down an, another rule uh, licensing a subject on the right hand side. Um, but the uh, GPSG has a better way of doing it. It says, uh, okay, we have a meta rule um, that says um, if there is a rule of the form V2 consists of something, then there is also a rule stating V3 consists of whatever V2 consists of plus an NP in the nominative. So formally that looks like uh, in 134, uh, if V2 consists of uh, whatever, right? So this W stands for whatever, then uh, there's also a, a rule in the grammar saying uh, V3 consists of whatever we had for V2 plus uh, N2 with a case nominative. Um, okay, so, so this is just a variable for a set of categories. So if we look at examples, um, so this is our uh, rule for, that these are our rules we had so far, like uh, V2 rules, and then we have V3 rules uh, introducing H7, the dative argument, and the nominative in addition. And here, in, a, in addition to H8, dative and accusative, we have H8, dative, accusative, and nominative, right? So, um, and of course, that applies to, to all the rules that we had. Um, so that we have uh, these V3 rules. So that's a uh, higher bar level. So Uskoreit assumes that there are three verbal uh, projection levels, not just two as in standard H, um, X bar theory. Um, okay. Um, the one, one more point to notice is that um, the nominative is now uh, among the daughters of uh, at, at the right hand side. So that means that uh, they are in the, the nominatives are in the same local tree as the other things. And therefore we can get the permutation of these elements. That's what we did in the previous part of the uh, lecture, right, uh, when we talked about uh, linearization. So we assumed that dative, accusative, and nominative are in the same, like, uh, in the same local tree. Okay, um, then uh, after introducing uh, meta rules, we can now turn to the passive. And um, the uh, we, we would need uh, a rule that sort of suppresses the, the subject uh, and on the right hand side of uh, the uh, uh, of a phrase structure rule. The difference between transformational grammar and uh, GPSG is that we do not have several trees that are related to each other, but we have uh, uh, various rules that can license uh, different structures and they rules, these rules are related to each other, um, but that uh, is nothing about um, online processing or something, right? So if you, if you think that your grammar should be somehow related to, um, to, to psycholinguistic evidence, then uh, GPHG is better off here because um, for, for the GB analysis, you have to assume that you have a sort of basic structure and you derive a passive structure from it. Or the other way around, if you uh, want to pass, you have a certain surface configuration and derive the deep structures from it. Um, if, if you don't think that is psycholinguistically real, then the question is why you assume these uh, transformations in the first place, right? Um, so, 
in in GPSG, it's uh, the cool thing is that if you want to analyze this sentence, weil der Weltmeister geschlagen wurde, then you just do it. You just take the uh, the phrase structure rule that is needed for that, and for the active, you take the active rule. Uh, there's no no way in which one of these senses is derived from another one. Okay, um, the passive uh, meta rule for that was suggested for English is given here in 193. Um, it says, okay, if we have a VP consisting of stuff plus uh, an NP, then we can derive a, a phrase structure rule from that um, where the NP is gone and we have an additional by phrase. Um, this rule is sort of strange because uh, it, it refers to the object uh, when, when doing passive, right? So if you remember our formulation, the descriptive formulation or pre-theoretical formulation, we, we want to suppress a subject or the nominative. But there's nothing about nominative here, right? So. Um, uh, the the rule here would not work uh, for for German. Um, furthermore, the rule does not refer to the type of the verb, so um, that's a problem because not all verbs have a passive. Um, but that probably could be fixed. But um, if we ha look at these VP rules, then the 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 meta rule just cannot apply because there is no object, right? So um, if if we come up with a different story about passive in GPSG, then it would be specific to German and would not be applicable to English. That's sort of not so nice because uh, passive in English and German uh, doesn't seem to be so different after all. Um, okay, so so that was passive i mean for 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 the german passive you could think of uh having uh the meta rule for the subject introduction apply to something and then um you can apply the passive to that suppressing the subject again and derive maybe derive all verb phrase uh phrase structure rules from uh fully clausal rules do it the other way around so that would be an option, but then it would be different from, from English and that's not nice. Okay, um, now let's turn to long distance dependencies. Um, there, uh, what we did so far is uh, given in 141, does der Mann dem Kind das Buch gibt with a final verb final serialization and gibt der Mann dem Kind das Buch as verb initial uh, serialization. Um, that can be done with our uh, local reordering of, of the verb and uh, arguments, but we don't have verb second, if you remember. Um, so um, the the sentence in 142 are not covered yet. Der Mann gibt dem Kind das Buch, dem Kind gibt der Mann das Buch uh, are not accounted for. Um, what we, what, what GPSG does is uh, that they analyze verb second as a, a sequence of local dependencies. So, um, that's what phrase structure grammars can do, right? So they can relate things that are next to each other. And GPSG found a clever way of transferring information from a, one local node to another local node. And um, uh, the, the basic idea um, of, of this approach goes also back to Harman, but uh, it was worked out uh, in the 70s by Gerald Gaster. Um, so, what is uh, what is uh, what are the details of the approach? Um, again, uh, meta rule. Uh, this time, 
combined with some notational tool, the slash, um, what it does is it says, okay, if we have some verbal projection, top level projection uh, with whatever categories plus one, a special category X, then we have another uh, phrase structure rule where we just remove this X and put it uh, behind the slash. Uh, and that's sort of a store uh, remembering that we removed that stuff. And we uh, add the remaining uh, things to the right hand side of the resulting rule. So, to give you some examples, um, if this is our rule 144, uh, consisting of H8, uh, dative, accusative, nominative, we can take whatever element we want here and put it into slash. So we get three new rules, one with a nominative missing, one with a dative missing, one with an accusative missing, and then all the other elements on, on the right hand side of the rule. Um, at the top of the tree, we need a special rule uh, that binds off non-local dependencies. So we have uh, the, the finite clause V3 with something missing and we combine this missing thing uh, with this uh, verbal projection that is missing something. So some X is combined with a, a sentence missing that X. Um, yeah, and, and we mark that uh, as top plus, that stand, stands for topicalization. That's not correct because also focus can be fronted. Um, but um, yeah, it, somehow we have to have a marker that, that something is fronted. So, um, it, to, to give you some examples, we can insert something here for the X, and that could be a dative or a nominative or an accusative. And here you have the example rule instantiations. So it's the same rule, but with three different examples. We don't have three rules for that. The X is sufficient. It's just three different instantiations. So here a nominative is missing and then it's realized uh, to the left of the uh, clause from which it is extracted. Okay, um, together with this uh, phrase structure rule, generalized phrase structure rule, uh, we need a linearization rule that says uh, the topicalized element uh, has to be realized to the left of all other things. Uh, so that means that this is really to the left and then this clause from which it is extracted follows. So um, let's look at an example. So this is the tree for dem Kind gab er das Buch. And uh, here we have a special dominance schema um, that is licensed by a meta rule and um, it put the dative into slash, right? So that's here behind the slash. And this rule licenses this subtree, gibt er das Buch. And you see the, the dative object is missing here. It's just recorded here that there is a dative missing. And um, then uh, the, there is a linearization rule that says, uh, okay, verb, plus MC plus main class has to be linearized to the left of the other elements. So that's initial. It could, could, could be final, but uh, here it's initial. And uh, the, the rule that combines uh, this clause with the extracted element requires that it's uh, MC plus, right? So by that, it, it makes sure that the verb here is placed in this position and not in final position. Okay, um, and this is the last step. The, uh, the uh, constituent that is marked as missing is uh, identified with the thing in the forefield, and then there is nothing uh, missing from the resulting phrase here. Okay, so 
you think, boy, that's complex, right? So a lot of phrase structure rules, different phrase structure rules than linearization rules and so on. Maybe we could develop something that allows us to say, okay, that's just flat here and uh, the imkind is serialized to the left and then the verb and then uh, the other arguments. There have been such uh, suggestions uh, in, in HPSG, um, but that wouldn't extend to all uh, clauses that are um, observable in German because the, uh, the element in the forefeld can travel really long distance. So there are some examples in the, in the textbook. We already discussed some in the GB session. Um, and, and here's just one um, from the literature. Uh, wen glaubst du, dass ich gesehen habe? So here you have an accusative object uh, that is extracted from an embedded clause. You cannot do that with a local tree where you reorder things, right? Because that's from a deeply embedded tree. So you need some tricks to get these cases. And here the mechanism that we just introduced is a very handy. Um, so to analyze the sentence in 151, um, you first uh, combine uh, ich and gesehen habe to form a v3 with a slashed accusative object. So this is licensed by a meta rule, right? That says, okay, I don't care about the accusative, just put it in slash. And then you combine that with a, uh, that complementizer. The uh, slash information is uh, passed on to the next higher node. Um, you combine the that clause with glaubst on do, so believe and you. And uh, again, the slash information is passed on. And then you bind it off the slash information uh, and identify it with a filler. Wen glaubst du, dass ich gesehen habe? Okay. So this again is uh, the, the, what, what I just said, uh, depicted in a tree. You have ich and gesehen habe uh, combined with the accusative put in slash. Then uh, you combine it with the does. Uh, again, percolate the, the slash up one uh, level further and to the next level once you combine it with glaubst and do. And then uh, in the next step, you bind it off here and then it's gone, right? Then the, you have a complete sentence with nothing in slash. Okay, easy, isn't it? Um, this is uh, uh, actually a very cool analysis and it gets uh, something right, which is non-trivial for other accounts. Um, so uh, it has an account for so-called across the board extraction. Um, the, if you look at these examples, uh, the kennel which Mary made and Fido slaps, sleeps in has been stolen. So you have which Mary made. So the Mary made the kennel and um, Fido sleeps in the kennel, right? So these things are uh, coordinated and um, uh, the, the, the which is uh, extracted from Mary made which and Fido sleeps in which. So it's um, what, what is coordinated are basically uh, sentences with uh, NPs missing. Um, in the B example, we have the kennel in which Mary's, Mary keeps drugs and Fido sleeps has been stolen. So you, we have in which Right, so Mary keeps drugs in which and Fido sleeps in which. So these are uh, again sentences where the same element, uh, the same, yeah, basically the same element is extracted. And what you can't do is um, the kennel in which Mary made and Fido sleeps has been stolen. So um, here you, you, have uh, a sentence with a, with a NP gap and a sentence with a PP gap 
and that doesn't work. You cannot coordinate that. And uh, the generalization is that if you coordinate things, the, the gap must match. And uh, then there, there is a filler for these two gaps in the, in, in the conjoints. And uh, if, you, if you do that um, in transformation analysis, the question is um, why should or why have this transformation to move something of the same category? And how can two different things land in the same position? So that um doesn't work right so uh there, there are proposals uh saying well yeah there are two gaps and then there's one filler but that that has to be some gpsg or hpg kind uh, of analysis uh, to make that work it cannot be done with transformations that really take something and put it some other place because it's it's two things right so and they land in one place so that's normally not possible Okay, so that's uh, it for GPSG. Uh, before I close this, uh, this session, I want to discuss some problems. So the, the first thing, the first problem is the representation of valence with these numbers uh, and morphology. Then there are problems with partial fronting and there is a formal problem with generative capacity of uh, GPSG. So the first thing is morphology. If you look at um, German bar derivation, so that's like Abel derivation in English, the generalization is that um, there has to be an accusative object. So um, we have lösbar, like solve a problem. Uh, lösen takes uh, an accusative. Um, vergleichbar, comparable. Uh, Again, vergleichen takes a nominative, accusative, and a PP. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the bar derivation can apply to such verbs. So the important thing is they have to have an accusative, but um, it does not work with uh, intransitive verbs like schlafbar or uh, helfbar. Um, because helfen takes a dative, not an accusative. And the generalization is if there's an accusative, then we can uh, uh, do the bar derivation. It's basically the, the bar derivation, like able derivation, is like passive, right? So you, you suppress the subject and the accusative object becomes the subject, the, the uh, derived adjective predicates over. If there is no accusative, then it doesn't work. Um, the, the problem is you cannot express this in, in GPSG. There is a number, right? The number says uh, in which rules you can uh, uh, surface as a verb, but uh, you don't know anything about the valence. It's just the rules that say, um, okay, there is an accusative uh, object or not. And if, as we just saw in passive, you would suppress the subject and the accusative gets nominative. So you're not even sure by looking at the number that there's an accusative. Um, uh, so what will be needed instead is some representation in the verb that says, okay, there's an accusative, there's a dative and so on. This is basically what uh, categorical grammar, LFG and HPSG are doing and uh, we will discuss that in, in the next sessions. Okay, there's another problem that's uh, partial fronting. Um, in, in German, you, in, in English you usually front VPs, right? But in German you can front partial VPs. So you can have, um, Erzählen wird er seiner Tochter ein Märchen können, uh, or ein Märchen erzählen wird er seiner Tochter können, seiner Tochter ein Märchen erzählen wird er können, uh, things like that, right? And the, the point about this is that you have the verb, the non-finite verb here, and the arguments of the verb are in the middle field, and they have to match. So you, you cannot do whatever you want here, and then realize some other arguments here, right? So you have uh, there has to be a connection between the fronted uh, part and the non-fronted parts. And that is not great for GPSG because if you, if you say erzählen can 
to, to, to get that, you would have to say ACN has to be, uh, it's like an intransitive verb with no argument, or you have to say uh, it's like a, uh, like a transitive verb, right? A strictly transitive with an accusative. Uh, it can also be just the dative, right? So th this this just doesn't make sense, right? So you have in these local areas, you have basically all valence patterns. And, and on top of that, you have to make sure that what is missing here is uh, realized here. Um, this is again the, the same point, right? If you have a verb like verschlung, uh, the arguments have to be here. Uh, verschlung hat er es nicht. You cannot omit the, the accusative, verschlung hat er nicht. And you cannot add a dative here, verschlung hat er ihm nicht. No way. So there has to be some connection, but that doesn't work in GPSG because we just have numbers and um, uh, there's a problem. And um, the, the solution that John Nerbon and Mark Johnson suggested to that problem in 86 is that they have a different representation of valence. So, and this uh, representation they suggested is basically similar to Gallegorian grammar and also similar to what HPSG does. Um, um, actually, Jean Nerbon uh, worked in GPSG uh, in later years. The third problem uh, is generative capacity. So, in principle, uh, GPSG was very cool cool because it uh, addressed a problem that was uh, um, around in, in the 70s. So uh, people discovered that uh, general transformations are very powerful. So they um, can generate um, Turing complete, uh, uh, the, the, the problem is basically Turing complete and um, they wanted to get more restrictive. So GB was one answer to that. And um, the, uh, the researchers who did uh, GPSG said, okay, we want to be even more restrictive. We develop something that is equivalent to context-free grammars. And uh, they described English as a context-free grammar. That worked well, very well. Um, but the problem is uh, that Shiva and Kuli um, could show that that is not sufficient for language in general. So they had uh, um, examples from Swiss German and Bambara uh, showing that natural languages uh, need more than context-free power in the grammars. And that basically means that GPSG cannot be, uh, at least with these restrictions um, that, that enforced uh, context-free grammars, uh, could not be the right model for um, uh, natural language in general. So that basically made, made it a lot more or a lot less attractive. Um, Okay, so all of these problems, like uh, the, the, the passive uh, thing, then the partial fronting, the morphology thing, uh, and the generative power, generative capacity uh, have been solved in uh, the successor of GPSG, namely in HPSG, and we will learn about HPSG in some sessions from now on. Okay, so that that was the GPSG session. The next session will deal with uh, feature descriptions. Um, that's a precondition for LFG and HPSG, uh, which we will deal with uh, in the next uh, weeks in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.